So today's webinar is titled Natural Enemies and Beneficial Bugs, What Are They? And it will be presented by Eric Middleton. Eric is an integrated pest management advisor based out of San Diego County. He's focused on increasing knowledge and exploring new tools for pest management. He's an entomologist by training, but is eager to challenge the way that people perceive and interact with insects by identifying pest management practices that are beneficial for humans and the ecosystem overall. I will now hand it over to you, Eric. Great, thank you. Go ahead and share my screen. And just to make sure, can everybody see that? Yep, you're good. Perfect, All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting. Today we're talking, as Lauren said, about natural enemies and beneficial bugs, going into what they are, how to promote them, and then also where you can learn more. Um, as you said, I'm an entomologist by training, so this is a topic that I'm really, really excited about. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's jump right into it. There's an outline of the different things we're going to be talking about today. First, we're going to sort of start a little philosophically about how I think we should be viewing insects, uh, thinking about them more as being beneficial as opposed to being detrimental like many people do. We'll then talk a little bit about some of the bad bugs, some of the ones that you don't want in your gardens and landscapes, uh, because that'll help us to identify then why the good ones are good bugs. And we'll talk about those good bugs, natural enemies, which include predators and parasitoids. We'll then talk a little bit about how to promote those natural enemies, how to keep them around, how to increase their numbers uh, around your home and in your garden. And then, as I said, we'll finish up with a little bit of information on where you can learn more. So with that, let's start off with the first section on how to view insects and then also the bad bugs. And so when we're talking about how to view insects, I think it's really important to note that insects are incredibly diverse and incredibly species. There are so many, so many different species of them, and there's also just a huge number of individuals. Um, and when we compare that to something we're perhaps a little bit more familiar with, let's look at mammals. We're mammals, um, and overall, there's about 6,400 species of mammal that have currently been described. If we compare that to insects, on the other hand, there's about 1 million currently described species of insect. And note that that's not including things like mites, spiders, millipedes, centipedes, a bunch of those other things. This is just strictly insects. So we are outnumbered hugely, not only in species diversity, but of course also in abundance uh, when it comes to insects. There's an incredible amount of diversity. And also to drive that point home just a little bit further, uh, normally when we think about, say, how many bees are out there, think there's honeybees, there's bumblebees, maybe there's one or two others. In reality, there's about 20,000 species of bees worldwide. So there's basically three times as many bee species as there are all mammals on the planet. Um, so insects, hugely, hugely diverse, hugely, hugely speciose. And what's interesting about that, of course, is that the vast majority of these insects and other arthropods are either beneficial or they're neutral. So they either have a direct benefit to humans or they just kind of help keep the ecosystem functioning. And that's really important because all of these insects, all these arthropods, they are absolutely critical for ecosystems to function up to and including the bad insects. So even when we get into the section of bad insects, these aren't things that you want to like never ever see. You just don't want them in as high of numbers because even those bad ones truly are important. And a good example of this that I often like to bring out is the idea of mosquitoes. Um, I've had numerous people ask me, what's the point of mosquitoes? Why do we have them? Aren't they terrible? Um, and yes, they are in many ways. Of course, they're an annoyance to many people and they can actually be very, very detrimental to human health, vectoring diseases like malaria. But those mosquitoes, even they are an important part of the food chain and the different ecosystems that they are a part of. They're a very valuable food source to fish, to other aquatic organisms, to other insects, to birds. And if they were all gone, it would be a serious detriment to the ecosystem overall. So with all this in mind, when it comes to viewing insects, kind of the insects, the take home message here is that you should give insects and bugs the benefit of the doubt because the vast majority of them are your friends or they simply just help keep things running smoothly. So they're things that you want to be having around, uh, want to be present, um, and you should generally view them as such. But with that in mind, there are some quote unquote bad bugs. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those. You can see in the background here, this is a dragon fruit flower that's covered with aphids and a whole bunch of ants attending to them. And that'd be an example of some of those bad bugs because yes, some insects can be serious pests in gardens, in landscapes um, and in your own yard. We're not gonna be talking too much about sort of the more 
pests that you may be finding inside your house or maybe to be directly attacking you, things like bed bugs or things like that. We're going to be talking about the things that are outside in the gardens and in your landscapes. And so it's really important to know what these bad bugs are, because if you know who the bad guys are, then you also know how it is that the good guys are helping you, which different bad bugs they end up killing or getting rid of. And so below are some, this is by no means comprehensive, some of the most common pests that can be found in gardens across the state of California. We have aphids, which are pictured in the background on the dragon fruit flower, thrips, which is the little picture just to the right. We also have mealybugs, and then we have scales, which is the picture on the far right hand side, mites and caterpillars. Again, these are just some of the most common pests that can be found in gardens in California. And we're going to go through these in a little bit more detail, a um, little bit of identification for them and some of the damage that they cause. So let's start off with aphids, uh, one of the most classic examples of bad bugs. You can see them pictured up here. They are soft-bodied, usually kind of pear-shaped, and very, very numerous. You're going to see quite a few of these in most cases if you are finding aphids. And there's many different species that are present across California. They come in all different varieties, all different colors. They'll feed on all different kinds of plants. Um, so there's really quite a few different aphids that are out there. One thing that's also important to note is that usually when we see them, they don't have wings, but they can have wings. Um, you may see them drifting around, flying around on the wind. Um, so if you do happen to see them and you think it looks like an aphid, but it has wings, it is in fact still uh, most likely an aphid. And these can be a really serious problem on a whole bunch of different plants. Um, they plug into the plant, they suck out the sap, um, and then they process that through their bodies and they end up excreting this thing called honeydew, which is really kind of concentrated sugar. Um, that gets dropped on the plants, can get dropped onto surfaces below, can make your patio, your car, or something really sticky. And that can also then lead to the development of things like sooty mold, which you can see in the picture on the upper left here. So that's that kind of dark, um, patina that's covering the leaves. That's a mold that's growing on the honeydew that comes from these aphids. So aphid feeding can directly harm your plants and then also can ind indirectly harm your plants or then other things around them through the presence of honeydew and sooty mold. And that's also something that you should be looking for to maybe get an idea that aphids or other sap sucking pests are present. Another pest that is a pretty serious problem in homes and gardens are thrips. Now these guys are very, very small. They tend to be yellow or they can be dark. The one up top is a Western flower thrips. The one down at the bottom is a greenhouse thrips. And those are two different varieties. You can see there's both the yellow and sort of the darkish one. They're oftentimes found on flowers. So if you take roses or sunflowers and kind of beat them over your hand, you can see a whole bunch of these little tiny guys start running around. Those really elongate tiny, tiny insects are almost certainly thrips. And they can cause some interesting different kinds of damage. So they can feed on uh, leaves, they can feed on the petals of plants, and they leave behind kind of these silvered, splotchy, stippled sections like you can see here uh, on the leaf. And the, the damage looks rather similar if it occurs on petals. They can also attack things like fruit and leave distinctive scars. So it's going to look like a scaly surface uh, to the fruit as it starts to grow. For the most part, thrips damage is cosmetic. Uh, even say for this fruit that you see here, the fruit is almost certainly perfectly fine. It just has a really kind of weird looking outside. The inside is perfectly normal. One other thing is that thrips can carry diseases. Uh, different TOSPA viruses can be carried by thrips, which can be more damaging and directly problematic uh, to your plants. So you have aphids, we have thrips, and now let's move on to mealybugs. Uh, these guys are very small as well. Um, they're usually covered in wax and they tend to feed in big clusters, kind of congregating in these enclosed spaces where they can really start to build up in numbers. Here's an example of a bunch of mealybugs that were feeding uh, the base of an orange, a, a newly developing orange, which is why it's so green. And then you can see their feeding has led to these kind of distortions uh, at the top of the orange. Um, so mealybugs, yeah, they tend to be immobile. As adults, just plugged into the plant, sucking away at sap. The immatures, the really small ones, which just look like tiny little specks of pepper, are much more mobile. They will then spread out, go over your different plant, um, and then they start plugging into the plant, feeding, and become more mobile as they become adults. And similar to the aphids, because they feed in a very similar way, just plug into that plant, they also produce honeydew, and the presence of sooty mold can also be a good indicator that things like mealybugs are present. Closely related to mealybugs, very similar, are these different types of scales. Here's a variety of different species, and they really don't even look like insects at this point. They just look kind of like these strange scabs or like the scales of fish or lizards kind of stuck onto trees. These are the adults 
that you see here, they are basically completely immobile. And then also just like mealybugs, the immatures are the sort of small mobile ones that will then disperse around, find different areas to feed, and then start to develop into these more bizarre looking kind of scales. And similar to mealybugs, these can produce honeydew. Uh, they can lead to the growth of sooty mold. And both of these different pests can be quite damaging um, feeding on your different plants. So those are two quite common ones that are found throughout many different places in California. And then one that I'm sure many of you are very unfortunate familiar with are spider mites. Here's a bunch of them pictured on the left-hand side, as well as some of their eggs. They are small, they are mobile, uh, and they can build up in populations quite quickly, especially on drought-stressed plants. Um, I'm sure many of you have unfortunately seen this, where they'll create webbing uh, that starts to extend all over different parts of your plants. Looks rather distinct from spider webbing. This is usually much more dense, and there's usually a huge number of mites that are kind of crawling and moving around on this webbing. So that's a very distinctive sign that spider mites are present. They leave behind kind of a stippled damage. So that you can see this leaf, which instead of a uniform green, now has a bunch of sort of lighter, uh, more yellowed sections across it, and also the presence of yellowing or dying leaves can also be indicative of spider mites in addition to that webbing. So certainly can be a problematic pest. And finally, one of the last pests we're going to be talking about, we have caterpillars, which again, I'm sure all of you are very, very familiar with, but there's many, many different species of caterpillars. They are, of course, the larvae of different moths and butterflies. Um, and usually some of the ones that are going to be most problematic are a little bit more camouflaged. They're going to be a little bit more green, a little bit more brownish, but of course caterpillars come in many different colors, can have all kinds of spikes, tufts, and things on them. And the presence that they are, the uh, signs that they leave behind are chewed sections. So they have chewing mouth parts. They'll be actively consuming and eating large sections of leaves, flowers, uh, the inside of vegetables or things like that. So if you find chewed sections, there's a good chance it's probably caterpillars. And then also the presence of frass, which is their feces. So these kind of um, crumbly sections uh, that are left behind look like little whole bunch of little black dots and specks. That's also a good sign that maybe caterpillars are present in your area. So these are some of the common bad bugs, the ones that we really don't want to be dealing with in the high numbers. There's aphids, thrips, mealybugs, scales, spider mites, and again, caterpillars. So these are kind of the, uh, I don't know, the classic bad bugs that you're likely to be running into. So with that in mind then, let's move on to the actual section about the good bugs, the natural enemies, the ones who help us to deal with all those various bad bugs. And so when we talk about the good bugs, um, I did originally have a section in here on pollinators. Um, talk ended up getting too long. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with pollinators, but something that people are generally a little bit less familiar with are these natural enemies. And so what is a natural enemy? A natural enemy is an organism that feeds on or reduces the numbers of other organisms. And usually those other organisms are things that we think of as pest organisms. And a great variety of things can be considered natural enemies. Um, pathogens can sometimes be considered natural enemies. Different fungi or bacteria that can harm pests can be considered natural enemies. Another thing that could be considered natural enemies are things like hawks or owls or things that maybe eat stuff like gophers um, or vertebrate pests that you have around. But for the most part, when people refer to natural enemies, this usually refers to insects and other arthropods that do this. And these are by far the most common things that you're going to be running into uh, around your home or garden is insects that are natural enemies. And these are actually quite important. So they provide at least $13 billion in pest control services in the US alone. And this number is almost certainly much higher. This is from a study that was done in 2006. And it was focusing mostly on uh, commercial agriculture and the benefit that natural enemies provide there. And of course, the world isn't just about commercial agriculture. Um, natural enemies provide a huge benefit outside of that. Um, so this is actually a number that is almost certainly significantly higher. Um, and natural enemies are very, very important for helping us manage pests. Now, natural enemies can occur naturally or they can be bought and released. And we'll talk a little bit about both of these, um, but many times you wanna be trying to promote natural enemies that will be naturally occurring as opposed to having to go out and purchase them yourself. And there's two different kinds of natural enemies that we're gonna be talking about today. We have predators and then we have parasitoids. And let's start off with the predators because there are many different insect species that are predatory and that can be useful and helpful to you. What is a predator? I think we all pretty much know that. We intuitively understand this when we think about it. A predator is an organism that must kill and eat others for food, and it does so by killing many individuals 
over its lifetime uh, in the same way that the lion is a predator then all different kinds of things like this assassin bug who's pictured up here is also a predator where it has to kill a whole bunch of different prey items and it consumes them over the course of its life and generally speaking there's two different main categories of predators we have the generalists and the generalists will consume a very wide range of prey and additionally can be omnivorous um, if you think about it we as humans are generalists. We eat a whole wide range of different things, both you know meat, vegetables, fungi, all these different things. Well, in that same way, many uh, insects that are predators are also generalists and also can be omnivores. And one of the classic examples is pictured over here are lady beetles, but then there's also things like lace wings and praying mantises. For the most part, those are all examples of generalist predators. On the other end of the spectrum, we have specialist predators, and these are individuals that consume a narrow range of prey. So sometimes they'll only go after one species. Sometimes they'll only go after one sort of closely related group of species. Um, a good example sort of from the vertebrate world are things like you know koalas or pandas, things that really only eat about one uh, type of food for the most part. The same thing is true of insects and some of these insect predators. And a good example of this, which is pictured here, is the two-spotted stink bug, which it primarily uh, feeds on Colorado potato beetle. So we both have the generalists and the specialists within the predators, but both of them can be very useful. However, for the most part, we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on the generalists because those tend to be the ones you're more likely to see in your garden. So let's get into a whole bunch of different examples of the predators that you're most likely to see, how you can identify them, and the different benefits that they can provide. So first and foremost, we're going to start off with the most classic one that most of you are probably familiar with, and that is, of course, our lady beetles. So there's many different species of lady beetles in California. For the most part, they tend to be these kind of round, very shiny beetles, and oftentimes their legs are sort of hidden up underneath their body. Um, they oftentimes are red or orange and then have spots on their back, but that is not always true. Uh, for example, we have a Dahlia bipunctata pictured up top. There's two different color morphs uh, of that species, and a bunch of other different species have a range of different colors. So just because it's not red and orange and spotted doesn't mean it isn't a lady beetle. Their eggs are usually kind of a yellowish color and are laid in clusters. So if you see a bunch of eggs that look similar to this laid in a cluster, these bright kind of lemon yellow eggs, you should probably leave them alone. They're most likely lady beetle eggs. They're larvae. This is also very important to recognize. The immatures look like these kind of small, dark alligators with kind of a bit long stick-like legs. And they usually move pretty quickly wandering around. They usually kind of a darkish color with uh, orangish sections on them. But generally speaking, they have that same appearance and for the most part are pretty dark. Their pupae, which uh, the larvae turn into before then emerging as adults, are kind of orange patterned, uh, once pictured up top, and they will be immobile. So if you see something like this, just this sedentary kind of blob, again, leave that in place because it's going to emerge as an adult lady beetle later on. So lady beetles, both as immatures and usually as adults, will feed on a variety of soft-bodied insects and then also a number of mites. So they feed on aphids, they feed on mealybugs, they feed on scales, they'll also feed on white flies, which we didn't really talk too much about. They'll go after mites and they'll go after a variety of different insect eggs. So very much generalist, they go after a whole bunch of different things for the most part. And many of them are also omnivorous, so they'll be feeding on pollen and nectar as well. And as I said, they are mostly generalists. They'll feed on many different things. However, some of them are highly specialized and will only feed on single types of prey. Just as a huge diversity of these lady beetles and a wide range of them that are very useful for you to have in your home and garden. We're going to go over a couple of those species right now. So some of the common generalists that you'll see, one of the biggest ones that you see all across California is the convergent lady beetle, Hippodamia convergens. And it's called the convergent lady beetle because up on its back here, you see there's these kind of two white lines that look like if they continued on, they would converge with each other. Other, hence it is called the convergent lady beetle. Very, very common species, species here in uh, California. Additionally, we have the multicolored Asian lady beetle. This is an exotic species. Uh, for some people, it's actually considered a pest because it starts getting inside your house, releases um, hemolymph, starts to smell a little bit, but they are actually important predators. They can help reduce the numbers of a variety of different um, soft-bodied insects. And they have a lot of different color morphs. One of the best ways to identify them is you see the white section kind of just above their head. It looks like there's a dark capital M that's uh, right there. 
And so that's one of the best ways to identify the multicolored Asian lady beetles. Look for that sort of dark M on the back of the head, as opposed to trying to count the number of spots or look at color, because they have a lot of variety within them. Additionally, we have the seven spotted lady beetle. These guys will basically always look the same. Um, seven spots, very round, a dark, deep red color. So these are common generalists that you will find. Um, again, they feed on a very wide range of different aphids, mealybugs, things like that. But then there are a bunch of those specialists. And these guys are really cool because they are very, very good at decimating populations of very specific pests. And we have something called the mealybug destroyer. The adult is pictured in the upper left of this picture. They've got a black section in the middle, kind of orange head, a little bit of orange on the abdomen, and their larvae kind of look like giant mealybugs. So they're covered with this um, bright white wax, and you can see them wandering around. So if you do see them, don't worry, you don't have super mealybugs on your hands. Instead, these are the larvae of the mealybug destroyer. And they, both the adults and the larvae, are voracious predators of all different kinds of mealybugs. So very, very useful to have around if you have a big mealybug infestation. Another species is the spider mite destroyer. Um, you're sensing a theme here with the mealybug destroyer, the spider mite destroyer. Uh, the spider mite destroyer is a very, very beneficial press, uh, excuse me, predator of spider mites. They're these tiny, solid black lady beetles, um, really, really small. So if you have a big spider mite population, you start to see the little tiny black specks moving around there. Those are probably spider mite destroyers. Another example, of a lady beetle that was introduced to California is the Vidalia beetle. And this beetle is specifically introduced to try to combat cottony cushion scale. And they're very, very effective, both the adults and larvae at consuming cottony cushion scale. So if you have a lot of cottony cushion scale present, check out for these little Vidalia beetles. Um, they will very quickly help reduce the populations. So lots of different lady beetles, both generalists and specialists. Very common, very common thing you'll have in your yard. And you want to have these present in your home and garden. Another really common generalist predator that you'll find are lace wings. So there's multiple distinct types in California, and they're basically all generalist predators that will eat almost any type of living prey. Um, so they're not omnivores, they're basically strict carnivores for the most part, um, and only the immatures are predators. So there's one picture up here you can see which is attacking a bug, sucking out all of its fluids. Um, the eggs look like these little kind of green balls at the end of the stalk. So if you see these, again, those are lacewing eggs, leave them in place. The immatures, there's one picture at the top, we'll see a couple more in the next slide. They kind of also look like a small alligator, um, but they have these big sickle-shaped mouth parts at the front, which they use to pierce their prey and suck out all of their fluids. The cocoons, which the larvae will turn into before emerging as adults, look like these kind of little small stringy balls. So again, if you see those, leave those alone because those are lace wings. You want to keep them around. And the adults, um, hence the name lace wings, they lace, they have large wings that kind of look like they're made of lace, full of all these different veins and large clear wings. The adults tend to be green or brown. They have these very long antennae, and you can often see them flying very early at night or very early in the morning. They're crepuscular, so sort of they're active at the different times uh, where it's transitioning from night to day, day to night. So those are the lace wings. There's two main types of the immatures of the larvae that you'll see. So we have kind of the quote unquote regular larvae and there'll be different variations in their size, uh, the length of their jaws. Here's two examples. The bottom one's a green lace wing. The top one I believe is a brown lace wing. These are the ones you're gonna see most commonly, these tiny little alligators searching around for food. But additionally, you can sometimes see these things called trash bugs. And they look like these little kind of moving piles of garbage. And basically what it is is that the lacewing larvae has covered itself with debris and also the corpses of all the food it's eaten. So it'll consume an insect and then sort of throw the corpse up onto its back um, to use as camouflage and as protection against predators. So if you see like these little tiny piles of moving garbage, those are trash bugs. Those are also a type of lacewing larvae. These are much less common in general than kind of the regular larvae. So you're much more likely to see just the normal sort of sickle jawed alligators. But if you do see the trash bugs, they're kind of cool and really fun to see. And again, beneficial predators as the larvae of lace wings. All right, one more of the really common uh, predators that you're likely to see are syrphid flies. So one's pictured up here, they're also known as hoverflies. There's many different species that are present in California. So again, a lot of diversity here, but it's the immatures, just like the lace wings, it's the larvae that are the important predators. Here's a picture that I took. You can see my thumb down here for reference and this little tiny green kind of worm or caterpillar thing, that's the larvae of the surfid fly. And those are the ones that are actually the predators. Here it is blown up a little bit. They feed on aphids, they feed on psyllids, and they feed on a bunch of different soft bodied insects. And they can be very, very important predators for those different uh, pests. The adults have kind of a distinctive yellow black stripes for the most part on their abdomen. They kind of look like bees and they have a distinctive hovering pattern in their flight. So they'll fly around, they'll stop, they'll hover, they'll dart, dart to somewhere else, they'll start hovering there again. And this is kind of cool because surfid flies have a double benefit because 
the larvae are predators, but the adults are important pollinators. So the adults will feed on pollen, nectar, they'll be flying around from flower to flower, and they're useful as pollinators, and at the same time, their larvae are helping you control pests. So kind of a cool double benefit when it comes to serpent flies. All right, now we're gonna be moving a little bit more rapid fire through some of the less common predators that you might see. We have things like the damsel bugs. So they're oftentimes easy to miss. They're small, they're quick. They're these elongated brownish insects. We have an adult up on the top left and an immature on sort of the bottom right. The immatures look basically the same as the adults, except they don't have wings and they're slightly smaller. And these guys are generalists. They'll prey on aphids, they'll prey on caterpillars, beetles, thrips, mites, and also a variety of insect eggs. Another predatory bug that you might see are the big-eyed bugs, which are so-called because they have big eyes, really creative name there. They are also small, fast predators. They have those really large eyes sort of uh, stuck onto the sides of their heads. The immatures, which is pictured over here, the immatures on the right, the adult is on the left. The immatures look like the adults, except they don't have wings, and they're usually a bit smaller. And both of them are predators. They are also generalists where they'll feed on aphids, caterpillars, and mites, but they're omnivores as well. So they will eat nectar and pollen in addition to their insects prey. Some other uh, predators that you may see, minute pirate bugs, which is a really, really cool name for them. As the name implies, they're small, um, and they're these little tiny checkered insects. Uh, so if you see like a really kind of small darkish insect with little checkered patterning on it, there's a good chance it may be a minute pirate bug. Their immatures are smaller, they don't have those wings, and they're usually more of an orange color, which is pictured over here on the right. And these guys also are generalists. They prey on aphids, sometimes on sort of the smaller caterpillars. Their feet on thrips, they're very important predators of thrips, go after mites, white flies, and also insect eggs. And then we also have predatory thrips. So thrips aren't just uh, a pest species. There's also a number of thrips that are predatory and a bunch of the different ones are pictured here. They are small overall because all thrips are pretty small, but generally speaking, these predator thrips are bigger than the other thrips. So it's kind of a relative measure. And almost all of them are kind of a more dark color with a few exceptions. But generally speaking, if you see larger dark thrips, they are more likely to be these predator thrips. The immatures look similar to the adults, except a bit smaller, and they will feed on pest thrips. So it is important to not just assume that all thrips are an issue, because if you do find a bunch of these dark thrips, they could actually be helping to keep your other pest thrips in check. Okay, there's also beetles. We have a, a variety of different predatory beetles that you may see, and one of the most common ones are ground beetle. There's two different species pictured here, but there are a whole bunch of different species around California. They are very fast, and for the most part, they tend to be dark beetles. So you'll see them running along the ground, um, <clears throat> hunting prey that can be found down on the ground. Their larvae, their immatures, kind of look like mealworms, except with large jaws. They'll usually live around in the soil. Um, and both of them are predatory on a range of different things. Again, these are generalists. They'll prey on larger pests for the most part. So they'll go after other beetles. They'll attack snails or slugs. And they also will go after different caterpillars. And again, ground beetles, as the name implies, are mostly found on the ground. But there's another type of beetle that you may find, which is useful, which are these soldier beetles. They're kind of more elongate. They usually have a bit more sort of long antennae, and they can be brown, black, yellow, or even a bit red, like the one pictured here. Their immatures look very similar to those of ground beetles, like mealworms with jaws. Um, and these ones are also generalists. They feed on aphids and insect eggs, but unlike the ground beetles, you're much more likely to find them up on the flowers or up on the foliage. So if you see um, beetles sort of up higher, they're more likely to be the soldier beetles. If you see quick moving beetles uh, running along the ground, well, those are probably the predaceous ground beetles. Last two predators that we're going to be talking about. There's also predatory mites. Mites are not just pest species. There's a range of different predatory mites that can be very important. They're usually very, very small, uh, quite hard to see, and they're also quite fast. So oftentimes they're maybe about the same size, a little bit bigger than the spider mites you could be seeing. They can be light yellow, tan, or red, like the one pictured on the right, and they'll feed on eggs, they'll feed on mites, um, they'll also feed on thrips as well. So they're important predators for all of those. And what's also kind of cool about these predator mites is that They'll sometimes even harass prey bigger than themselves. So if you have uh, adult thrips that are a bit bigger than these mites, while the mites can't eat them, they will still chase the thrips away, prevent them from feeding, and actually really reduce the damage that those thrips can cause. So the predator mites um, are very beneficial for dealing with thrips um, and other different mite species like spider mites. And speaking of spiders, the last group we're going to be talking about, yes, spiders are also predators and can be very important. Basically, all of them are predaceous. And while we may often think of them as kind of pests or not want too many of them around in general, they are important 
important uh, to have around. They're generalists, they'll feed on larger and or flying insects, and yes, they also are your friends. Um, so yeah, you maybe don't want too many spiders hanging around if you're constantly running into their webs, but they are an important part of the ecosystem, and they truly are useful for helping keep a range of different pest species in check. There's a whole lot of information, we'll review it all in just a second, but Let's get now on to the parasitoids, which you probably are a little bit less familiar with. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about them. So parasitoids, what are they? Well, basically the definition of a parasitoid is an organism that lives in close association with a host organism and eventually kills it. So basically what that means is that for a parasitoid, it needs a host in order to complete its life cycle and it must kill that host in order to complete its life cycle. And usually that means it consumes the host from the inside out. So a good way of thinking of these, if you've ever seen the movie Alien, that's basically exactly what parasitoids are. Uh, they implant themselves in a host, they grow in there, and then eventually they burst out of them and run away to go and infect other things. Parasitoids are pretty horrific. It's a good thing we don't have any, um, but they're really common in the insect world. And for the most part, the majority of these are these tiny, tiny little wasps. Um, you can see pictures of the wasp up top, another one in the middle where it's uh, actively stinging an aphid, laying an egg inside of it. So most parasitoids are these tiny wasps, but there are also some beetles and flies that are parasitoids as well. And they tend to be highly specialized. They tend to attack just maybe one species or a group of closely related species, um, as opposed to being really broad generalists that attack a whole lot of things. Although there is some variation within that. And parasitoids are extremely important for pest control. Despite the fact that they're much smaller, much less well known in general, they are almost always more impactful for regulating pest populations than predators are. Parasitoids are extremely important, and they are definitely something that you want to have around if you're going to be regulating uh, your pest numbers. So when it comes to parasitoid identification, it's tricky. And I'm not going to be going into as much depth listing kind of all the different common parasitoids you might be seeing as I did with the predators. And the main reason for that is that they're really hard to identify without good magnification. That's partially because they're very small. Um, most of them are wasps. So it's kind of more difficult for someone who has, doesn't have a little bit more specialization to distinguish them. Um, but also they spend a lot of their lives inside hosts. So they necessarily need to be growing up inside of a host, which means that for a lot of the life before it emerges as an adult wasp, it's just sitting inside another insect. And therefore, it's a little bit harder for you to see them. If you do see the adult parasitoids, you're usually going to find them when they're right next to the hosts that they're attacking, either right when they're stinging them or sometimes they'll be feeding a little bit on the hosts as well. So oftentimes, it's better to look for signs uh, that the parasitoids are present instead of looking for the actual adult parasitoids themselves. And one of the biggest signs that parasitoids are present are the presence of mummies. So all of these different aphids you can see in both of the pictures have been parasitized. Um, and what a mummy basically is, they turn into what we call mummies. And what a mummy basically is, is that it's a parasitized host that hardens. So a aphid, for example, will get stung. It looks like a normal aphid for a bit as the parasitoid larvae grows inside of it. It eventually starts to swell, uh, turn a different color, and then hardens and dies and turns into this kind of case um, that exists around the parasitoid as it develops. And then the parasitoid will chew its way out of the back and then fly off uh, to go infest other things. And so you can see for some of the aphids down here at the bottom, there's holes present in the back of them. And that indicates that the parasitoid that was inside has chewed its way out and flown away, whereas some of the other ones are still intact. There's probably still a parasitoid inside them. So that's what mummies are, these kind of hardened um, tan or dark shells of aphids or other insects. And they can also kind of look like small capsules. So in this picture on the right here, these are from mealybugs and scales that have been parasitized. Uh, their immatures kind of turn into these capsule-like things, kind of like pill capsules. And they're basically a different type of mummy where you can see some of them have holes in them where the adult parasitoids have then emerged later on. So if you see these mummies, you'll most likely see them in aphids, but you can also see them in things like uh, scales and mealybugs. If you see them, that's a very, very good sign that the parasitoids have been present. And then additionally, if you just see tiny wasps in general, there's a very good bet that you're looking at parasitoids there as well. So let's go into a little bit more depth about the wasps themselves. Um, there's many, many different wasp species that can be parasitoids. Here's a smattering of different examples of what they can look like. They're very small, almost always. Um, they're oftentimes kind of metallic or shiny look to them. And there's tens of thousands of species of these wasps that are parasitoids. So it's not feasible to try to learn them all by any means. Um, and again, as I said, they're quite hard to identify. Generally speaking, they're gonna be attacking the smaller pests. They're gonna be going after aphids. They're gonna be after mealybugs, scales, and eggs. Here's another example of uh, two aphid mummies, one with a hole where the parasitoid has emerged, another one that's still intact, and then a healthy aphid in between. 
As I said, these ones are likely to port mummies. So the main mummies you're going to be seeing are from parasitoid wasps. And there's a great range of parasitoids, some of which have been purposefully introduced to control invasive species. Um, you may hear about this later on in the webinar on invasive species a bit later. Uh, but an example of this is Tamarixia radiata, which has been introduced to help control the Asian citrus psyllid. This picture down here at the bottom. Asian citrus psyllid being a pretty serious pest that can vector uh, citrus greening disease. Um, which is a really serious disease of citrus. And oftentimes, um, these parasitoids can be extremely impactful for pest control, sometimes on their own, basically just reducing the need for any other control methods. Or in the case of something like Tamarixia radiata, it's part of an integrated pest management strategy and helps keep uh, pest numbers in check. So the wasps are a good example of parasitoids. There's also flies. Uh, pictured up here, we have the tachinid flies, which are decently large. They're hairy, and they kind of resemble house flies that you might normally see. And generally speaking, they'll be attacking larger pests, things like caterpillars, crickets, grasshoppers, and beetles, they will be attacked by tachinid flies. And the tachinid flies will lay their eggs inside of the host. So this picture of the caterpillar has these kind of dark sections on it. That's where eggs have been implanted inside the caterpillar, and then it will grow into a uh, larvae, which will start consuming it from the inside. Additionally, tachinid flies can also sometimes glue their eggs to the host. So this poor caterpillar here has had tachinid fly eggs glued onto its head. They will then hatch into larvae, which will burrow into the caterpillar and to begin to consume it. Once the tachinid fly larvae have eaten their fill, killed the host, they will then emerge from the host, drop to the ground, where they will then pupate. The pupae kind of look like these uh, kind of brown cigar shaped things as pictured here. So as a review of all of that, all the different natural enemies we've talked about, some of the most common predators, you've got lady beetles, you have lacewings, and you had surfed flies. These are some of the most common. You're almost certainly going to see these, especially if you have a healthy garden ecosystem going. Some of the other ones that you uh, might see that are quite beneficial, things like predatory thrips, damsel bugs, big-eyed bugs, minute pirate bugs, and then both of the different types of beetles, the ground beetles and soldier beetles. And then finally, some of the things that aren't actually insects but are still very useful are predator mites and spiders. And then, of course, when it comes to the parasitoids, we have both the tachinid flies and the parasitoid wasps. So again, this is not comprehensive. There are many other natural enemies you may see, but here's a good example of a lot of the different ones you are likely to run into. So with that, how do you promote these natural enemies? How do you keep them around your garden, your yard? Um, because you do want them there to help you with pest control. So broadly what you can do in order to promote natural enemies are, well, you could purchase them. Um, you can also limit the number of disruptions in your yard to make it more favorable habitat for these uh, natural enemies. And additionally, you can actively be providing them resources, which makes it a much better place for them to live and will increase the number of natural enemies. And we're gonna start off with the idea of purchasing them because this is something you oftentimes see. You can go out and you can buy numerous different predators that are commercially available. You can buy lady beetles, lacewings, mites. You can buy my new pirate bugs. Uh, on the right-hand side, an example of a whole bunch of these predatory mites you can buy that come in a little container. Below, there's a picture of me holding a whole bunch of mealybug destroyers uh, that are about to release in a citrus orchard. So you can buy all of these, and to some degree, you can also buy parasitoids, but they're usually a little bit less commonly available. And you may be thinking this is a really great way to manage pests, and sometimes it is, but the results certainly are mixed. Um, oftentimes, when you release these predators, they'll start to leave once they've controlled the prey. Once the prey is gone, they'll then move somewhere else. And so they're not usually going to sort of persist in the area and make sure everything stays low. They'll potentially knock the, back the pre the uh, excuse me, the pest populations, and then move on to somewhere else. So oftentimes this means you need to frequently buy and re-release these things in order to get that control that you need. All that being said, this means that this oftentimes can be quite effective in things like commercial agriculture, but oftentimes it's a bit less effective uh, for gardeners and not quite the bang for your buck that you might hope it is. So generally speaking, yes, you can purchase natural enemies if protests if pests are particularly bad, and they certainly can help you in a variety of different situations. But for the most part, I would say it's better to improve conditions for natural enemies in your yard or your garden, as opposed to trying to purchase them and augment uh, the natural enemies you have. So yes, you can purchase them. That's sometimes effective, sometimes not. But I think it's better to try to make your yard um, a more hospitable place for natural enemies. And the first way you do that, as we said, is by limiting different disruptions. And one of the biggest things you can do with that is to try to reduce pesticide use. And that's because most pesticides can have an impact on natural enemies, whether that directly kills them, whether it has these more sublethal effects that affect their ability to survive or find prey. A lot of different pesticides will have an impact on natural enemies, and that includes insecticides which we might sort of assume will have an impact on natural enemies, but it also includes things like fungicides and herbicides, which can be detrimental to parasitoids 
and predators. And one thing that's also important to say is that just because you're using organic options doesn't mean that that is not harmful um, to these different natural enemies. Organic options can very much still be harmful. A good example of this is spinosad, which is found in things like Monterey spray. It's actually a very common ingredient in uh, organic insecticides. It will kill surfeit flies, and it can be directly toxic to a number of different uh, beneficial organisms. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't be using these, but it means you should be aware that these organic options can still be harmful to natural enemies. Here's a good example of a table that will be available. Uh, it's available on the UCIPM website. You'll get links uh, where you can find some of this later on. And this looks at the relative toxicity of insecticides to parasitoids and predators. So you have both direct toxicity and residual toxicity. Direct is basically if it's applied straight to the predator or parasitoid, will it harm it? Residual basically means that if you apply it and then later on the natural enemy comes over, will that uh, then harm the natural enemy? And so what you can basically see is that there's a couple that are a bit better um, for natural enemies that are less directly toxic and have no residual activity. And those are the things that, broadly speaking, you should be trying to use if you have to be using pesticides. So if need be, focus on using microbials, botanicals, and oils or soaps, as opposed to the other different things like neonicotinoids, pyrethroids, or organophosphates in your home and garden. And also just note that in some cases, pesticides can actively harm good pest control. A good example of this is mealybugs, where when people are applying broad spectrum insecticides, while it will kill some of the mealybugs, it also gets rid of a bunch of those natural enemies, the parasitoids and predators that keep them in check. And then the mealybug populations will start to grow and grow, uh, and you sort of get caught in a vicious cycle until you stop using those broad spectrum insecticides and allow the natural enemies to come back and control mealybugs. So generally speaking, try to reduce your pesticide use. That's going to help uh, promote natural enemies and limit the disruptions that they may have. Also, you generally speaking want to reduce the amount of times you're mowing, tilling, or removing debris in your yard because stability is better for most natural enemies and natural enemies will live in vegetation, they'll live in leaf litter, and they will also live in the soil. So if you're going out there and you're mowing or removing vegetation, well, that destroys habitat because long grass and weeds provide a source of habitat and food for these natural enemies. Again, that doesn't mean you can't ever do this, but just be aware that you know if you let things grow a bit more, uh, grow a bit longer and don't disturb them nearly as frequently, you're more likely to have more stable populations of natural enemies. Another good example, if you're blowing your leaves, removing leaves and debris, that also will remove habitat because ground beetles will live in things like leaf litter. Another example for a different type of beneficial insect is bees will often size, nest inside of the dead stems of different grasses or things like that. So if you remove all these things that look kind of like dead debris or plants, this also is getting rid of habitat. And oftentimes it's much better to just leave them in place. Additionally, if you're going out and tilling, it's used in gardening. It can be very beneficial to kill pests, so it certainly has its place, but also be aware that tilling can kill predators in the soil and a lot of different predaceous larvae that are living down on the ground. So again, all these things can be done, but try to do them in moderation and be aware that they can be harmful to natural enemies. So as much as possible, as much as is feasible, disturb vegetation, debris, and soil as little as you can. And also, as much as you can, let your space be a little bit more wild. The more wild it is, usually the better it is for these different natural enemies. So when it comes to limiting disruptions, you're going to be reducing pesticide use, try to reduce mowing, debris removal, and things like that, and let things be a little bit more wild. And finally, we're getting into the section of providing resources. This is what you can do to actively try to promote these natural enemies. And the biggest thing is increase biodiversity in your yard and around your garden. Greater biodiversity almost always correlates to a greater number of natural enemies. That's because biodiversity leads to an increased abundance and diversity of resources, which means a greater abundance and diversity of natural enemies can be present. And you can do this by increasing animal diversity. If you leave minor pests alone, things that aren't really causing you a problem, some herbivores that really aren't harming you, if you leave them in place, these can act as prey for natural enemies. This is oftentimes called alternative prey. Basically, these things that aren't the main pests that are of concern to you, the predators come in, they eat those, they survive off those, it allows the natural enemies to persist, and then they can move in and try to clean up the pests that are actually more concerning to you. So generally speaking, try to leave uh, some of those pests that really aren't a big problem for you. That'll help bring in the natural enemies and allow them to persist. And of course, probably what's easiest is increasing plant diversity. There's many, many different ways you can do this. You can leave weeds in place. You can plant multiple crops practicing sort of polyculture. You can leave sections of your yard more wild, or you can have things like hedgerows uh, that are growing. Areas that are undisturbed or where there's a greater number of plants uh, growing, that's really, really important um, for increasing biodiversity for natural enemies. And flowers in particular are very important. We're gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about this because 
one of the best things for promoting natural enemies and promoting beneficial insects in general is to plant flowers. This is something I did my PhD research on, so it's something I am quite interested in. But generally speaking, flowers provide many resources to natural enemies. They provide pollen, nectar, habitat, and also because they attract a bunch of different herbivores, they provide a source of alternative prey. So establishing floral strips or patches or just kind of floral areas in your yard really is great for natural enemies, and it's also good for things like pollinators. When you have floral plantings, there's a couple of different traits that you want them to have. First, you want to have usually a mixture of perennials and annuals with a little bit more preference towards perennials. Um, those are things that, again, will be stable for a long period of time, and the stability is very important for natural enemies. You also want to have many different species planted, not just one or two different things, but a range of different things, 10, 15 different species that are going there. There's multiple reasons for that, but basically there's increased biodiversity, increased different types of resources that are present. And additionally, that makes it much easier for those things to be blooming throughout the year or growing season. You don't want Want everything to be flowering all at once. You want a stable source of resources that is constant throughout as much of the year as possible. If you're down in Southern California, you can oftentimes have things that are blooming all throughout the year. If you're in areas where there's a bit more of a winter, then you want to be uh, blooming through as much of the growing season as possible. And also it's good to have native flowers in the mix. Um, there's a variety of reasons for this, but basically they're more well adapted to whatever area you're in, and they also will be providing resources that native insects uh, can use to a greater degree. The Xerces Society has some location and specific information on different flowers that you may want to plant. I would highly suggest looking into them. Uh, unfortunately, my experience with this is all from the upper Midwest, so I know what to plant uh, in Minnesota, down here in California, not quite as much. But the Xerces Society does have good information on that if you want to be looking into specific things you can plant to promote natural enemies. So when it comes to providing resources, increase biodiversity, leave alternative prey alone, and especially try to plant more flowers. All right. We're at the very end here, which is where can you learn more? So just note that all these sources, uh, as Lauren said, will be sent in a follow-up email later, so you can find all of them there. I'm just going to briefly go through all of them. We have the UC IBM website, we have the UC Master Gardeners, and then we also, as we mentioned, have the Xerces Society. So first off, the UC IPM website, website is listed right up there. There's tons of information about pests, the best way to control them, and there's information both for people uh, in homes and gardens and also for commercial farmers. So this is a really, really great resource. And within that, there's also a whole bunch of other resources. The Natural Enemies Gallery, which is down at this um, URL here, is a great way to look at all the different natural enemies that can be present, the different pests that they feed on, get pictures of them, get more information on them. It's sort of a much longer form of this talk. So I'd highly recommend looking into that. And additionally, there's information on pesticides, what you can uh, pick that's less uh, damaging to natural enemies and basically how you can try to be using pesticides in conjunction with natural enemies. That uh, information is also available on the website. So UCIPM website, extremely valuable resource for everything related to pests, highly recommend you look into it. If you do have more specific questions, then you should look into the UC Master Gardeners. The Master Gardeners are UC trained volunteers. Uh, they're really, really great and incredibly valuable resource because they're very knowledgeable about growing, gardening, and about pest management as well. And they're specifically there to be able to answer questions from the public, to be able to provide resources and education to the general public. So if you have a specific question about something in your yard or things like that, reach out to the Master Gardeners. Um, on their website, you can find a map with uh, all the different counties in California where you can then pick whichever one you're in and I'll redirect you to the Master Gardeners uh, for your county. Most California counties have the Master Gardeners. Again, it's a really great resource. I highly recommend you take advantage of. And finally, we have the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They have a really strong conservation focus, so do keep that in mind. If you're looking more at things from a pest control perspective, they might not be the best place for, but if you're looking for things from a conservation perspective, they're really great. They've got great resources for preserving, promoting pollinators and natural enemies. And again, there's location-specific information. They have seed mixes that you can um, look into for planting to promote pollinators and also for natural enemies. And so with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be really happy to take them. Uh, my email is also listed below if you want to reach out for me. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eric, for that great presentation.